The next thing we're going to do in this course is to spend a fair bit of time talking about a variety of functional groups that are based on the carbonyl, which as you can see here is a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen. Now there's a certain amount that we can understand about a carbonyl in terms of its analogy to an alkene, uh, which of course is just uh, two carbons double bonded to each other. Uh, so there's certain similarities, but there's also a number of very important differences. So one of the major differences is the fact that uh, alkenes uh, in and of themselves don't have a dipole, and that's because uh, two atoms, um, of course, have the same electronegativity, so there's going to be no polarization between those two, um, unless there's you know, substituents on one of them that uh, is, is more electronegative. Um, but in the case of the carbonyl, uh, you have two different elements with the oxygen being much more electronegative. So in this case, there is actually going to be a very significant dipole for a carbonyl. And that very much dictates uh, its reactivity differences. And so one of the easiest ways to understand the reactivity of a carbonyl is simply to consider this major resonance form uh, where you would place the uh, electrons from that double bond up onto the oxygen. Um, and you would do that because it's the more electronegative uh, carbon or, sorry, atom. Uh, and so this resonance form allows you to understand uh, the, the fact that uh, carbonyls will react with nucleophiles at the carbon. Okay, so. This is something that you, you definitely do not want to do uh, whenever you're, you're thinking about the chemistry of carbonyls or drawing a mechanism, is to do nucleophilic attack at the oxygen. That simply doesn't happen. And uh, again, this resonance form shows you why. There's already electron density um, at that oxygen, and so to add more would simply be unfavorable. Instead, nucleophiles react at the carbon. And so uh, overall, carbonyls are generally electrophilic, okay? Rather than being nucleophilic, they're electrophilic, and uh, they are electrophilic at the carbon. Okay, And uh, you can also see this with uh, some of these um, electron density maps. So I show the one of just simple formaldehyde here, um, so you can see the structure um, inside this. And this is sort of a, an idea of what the electron cloud of this molecule would look like. And here, um, red represents uh, portions of high electron density and blue, relatively low electron density. And you can see very much that um, the, uh, the sites of low electron density um, are at the carbon end of the carbonyl, and the sites of more electron density are up at the, at the oxygen. Okay? So we can also think about um, double bonded species uh, using molecular orbital theory, right? And so uh, I, I show here, uh, just to remind ourselves, um, what the picture looks like for a carbon-carbon double bond, for an alkene. Remember, we are um, conceptualizing this uh, as if we were taking two isolated p orbitals, each with an electron, bringing them together to form two molecular orbitals, one of which is going to be in phase, so, right? So you're going to get a bonding orbital. We call that the pi orbital. Uh, that's the one that the electrons go into. And then there's going to be a, an out-of-phase uh, combination of those orbitals. So that's the antibonding pi star orbital. Okay, so that's the picture of an alkene, and the molecular orbital description for a carbonyl is actually relatively uh, the same. It's, it, it actually looks a lot like uh, an alkene, right? So here's the carbonyl. What we're doing in this case is instead of two carbons, we're combining one carbon with a p orbital and an electron, and an oxygen with a p orbital and an electron. Okay, so we're combining those, but the combination is fundamentally the same. There's an in phase um, combination that gives us the pi. Uh, molecular orbital of the carbonyl, that's where the electrons go, and there's an out-of-phase uh, combination, that's the pi star. Okay, and so um, you, you, you see the same fundamental um, combination um, for, for any double bonded species, um, whether it's carbon-carbon or carbon-oxygen. Um, one thing you might note though is, right, so I've placed all the carbons at the same energy level, which would make sense since they're the same element, um, but the oxygen is lower. And so why is that? Well, oxygen is more electronegative. It's going to hold the electron tighter, right? And so that's actually more stable. It's a, it's a more stabilizing uh, interaction between the nucleus and the electron if, they, if they're held more tightly. And so that's why you put the oxygen at a lower energy level to start with. And, well, the same effect will take place within the molecule. So uh, not only is this starting orbital lower in energy, but both the pi and the pi star are also lower in energy than in the case of the carbon-carbon double bonds. Okay, so both the pi mo and the pi star mo uh, in a carbonyl are lower than in an alkene. Okay, They're, the electrons that fill those orbitals are more stabilized because the oxygen is more electronegative. 
Okay, well that has a significant impact on the reactivity of the carbonyl. Okay, so uh, you are now very familiar with the fact that alkene pi bonds are typically nucleophilic, right? So you learned a whole lot of chemistry where the alkene double bond will react with an electrophile uh, in this sort of fashion. But because in a carbonyl the pi bond is a lower energy, um, carbonyl pi bonds are not typically nucleophilic. They are not going to react with electrophiles in that same way that alkenes do. Okay, so we're going to see, again, nucleophilic chemistry, not electrophilic. Uh, the one thing that we will see with carbonyls, though, it, that's different than alkenes, is, is the fact that we have these lone pairs on the oxygen still. Right? Two lone pairs, and so those actually can be nucleophilic. Right, so what we will see is instead of the pi bond engaging an electrophile, we will actually engage these uh, lone pairs of the carbonyl. So we'll do this type of, of reaction um, very often with a proton. So we'll protonate the lone pairs of a, of a carbonyl. Okay, so it, it might seem a little bit by, uh, like splitting hairs here, but uh, it's fundamentally different uh, which electrons are engaging with an electrophile. Okay, so. Uh, as I said, uh, the, these, uh, the carbon oxygen pi bond is not nucleophilic, but instead it is electrophilic. It's going to react with nucleophiles, okay? And that is because not only is that pi bond lower energy, but the pi star is also lower energy. Now, keep in mind that um, you know, if a nucleophile is going to react with a molecule, it can't go into a filled orbital, right? So a nucleophile reacting with a carbonyl is not going to interact with the pi orbital because that's already filled. There's no vacancy. Instead, it's going to interact with the pi star because that's where there's a place for electrons to go, okay? So the fact that this pi star orbital is lower in energy uh, makes the, uh, the reaction of carbonyls with nucleophiles relatively favorable. So we're going to see this type of reactivity uh, very, very much with, with carbonyls. The nucleophile adds and gives us this type of intermediate. And of course, this is exactly the opposite of what we tend to expect with normal alkenes. We, uh, you uh, did not learn um, really chemistry where a nucleophile adds to an alkene to give this type of intermediate. It's just, it just doesn't happen. And, um, and one way to conceptualize that is because the pi star of the alkene is simply too high in energy. Okay? All right, so... Uh, here we have the, the carbonyl um, molecular orbital uh, situation, and we are going to react with nucleophiles via the pi star orbital, right? So this is where nucleophiles go, again, because there's a vacancy here, there's no vacancy there. Um, and now, if you think about, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about nucleophiles interacting with this orbital, um, it, it's worthwhile considering the shape of those orbitals. And so here's the actual um, calculated uh, molecular orbitals. Um, so instead of these little cartoon pictures, we can get a, a little bit better sense of what they actually look like. So here's the picture of the pi orbital. Um, so this is for formaldehyde, uh, basically the simplest carbonyl. So here's the pi orbital, right? Hopefully that looks familiar. And here's the pi star, okay? So in the pi star, we actually have um, the greater density at the carbon uh, of the carbonyl, okay? And so again, this correlates very well with the fact that nucleophiles are going to add to the pi star at the carbon, not at the oxygen, but at the carbon, okay? All right, so again, this is going to be extremely familiar to you uh, over the course of, of the next couple of weeks. We're gonna keep, keep adding nucleophiles to carbonyls in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that what's happening in terms of the actual carbon of the carbonyl is it's uh, starting out as an sp2 hybridized carbon in the carbonyl, right? So everything's planar. And as the nucleophile adds, you go to this type of intermediate where it's now become sp3 hybridized. So remember, sp3 hybridized has a tetrahedral geometry. And so this type of intermediate with uh, carbonyls is, is very often described as the tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, so we'll say, we'll talk about carbonyl chemistry and we'll talk about the tetrahedral intermediate um, doing something uh, perhaps. Okay, so uh, keep in mind that term and the fact that this hybridization is changing from sp2 to sp3. Okay, the other thing that you'll come to understand is that in certain cases, this type of addition is actually reversible. It certainly depends on the nature of, of this uh, group here or, or possibly one of the other groups, uh, but it's possible for the tetrahedral intermediate to collapse. Okay, so we're gonna see actually both forward and reverse reactions quite a lot. Right. So we're gonna begin into our discussion of carbonyls um, and uh, conceptually there's uh, 
sort of two uh, different classes of carbonyls that we'll talk about. And the first class has to do um, with aldehydes and ketones. Okay, so either aldehydes or ketones. And the reason we lump these together is because when these react with nucleophiles, they go to give tetrahedral intermediates that really um, can't do much else. They don't have any further chemistry except to be protonated and, and go to neutral alcohols. Okay? Um, there's some exceptions to that depending on what the nucleophile might be. But in general, um, you know, for example, if you add a Grignard to an aldehyde or ketone, you go to this uh, intermediate and that's it. That's the end of the story. On the other hand, the other class of carbonyl that we're going to talk about um, is carboxylic acid derivatives. So these are going to have a substituent that's not alkyl or hydrogen. Um, it's going to be some heteroatom. Okay? And what can happen in this case is a nucleophile can add to get to a tetrahedral intermediate like this. But now in this case, this will actually have the ability to collapse back out. And in, uh, instead of spitting out the nucleophile that added, it'll spit out a, whatever that group is, right? So you can do a substitution reaction on carboxylic acid derivatives um, to give these new species, right? So that's not possible with aldehydes and ketones, but it is for carboxylic acid derivatives. So we're generally going to split those two up and, and uh, sort of treat them separately um, as we begin our discussion of carbonyls.